I'm Greg Lukianoff, president of FIRE, the Foundation for Individual Rights in Education. In the popular imagination, the 1960s and 70s represented an unparalleled flowering of open communication, tolerance for differences, and appreciation of free speech and free minds at our nation's colleges and universities. Lecture halls like this one routinely rang out with controversial give and take between students and professors. Sadly, today's campuses show a profound lack of concern for open debate and discussion. The following video exposes a major campus initiative that not only told students what they couldn't say, but told them what they must say, must think, and must believe. Rather than respecting their students' individuality, this program at the University of Delaware sought to replace a healthy diversity of opinion with dreary enforced conformity. It's football Saturday at the University of Delaware. A part of campus life that every student expects and a welcome break from the daily rigors of academic life. In an idyllic setting of red brick Georgian architecture dating back to its founding in 1743, Delaware is a highly sought-after school. More than 25,000 students apply to become freshmen each year. Most of them will live in campus dormitories like these, where in recent years freshmen were required to attend an unusual orientation program that would bring widespread attention to the university. Most American colleges and universities operate orientation programs. They're led by paid residence advisors who are themselves students. But here at Delaware, two campus administrators, Kathleen Kerr and James Tweedy, headed a residence life program designed not to orient, but to indoctrinate. The results for the university and its trustees would be embarrassing. One of the more ridiculous programs that we were made to, to participate in was uh, we were gathered in a circle around a large bowl of marshmallows uh -huh. and a series of statements were read off. And if you've ever been afraid to show affection for your significant other in public, if you've ever been afraid to walk through a dark alley at night, and if any of these statements applied to you, you would take a marshmallow and you would place it inside your mouth and you, you would hold it there. And any time the statement applied, you'd take another marshmallow. Mm -hmm. such, but these statements were targeted towards women, to, to gays, to minorities, such that by the end of the evening, uh, if, if you were a white male, you didn't have any marshmallows in your mouth. Uh -huh. But if you were, say, you know, an African-American female, you had marshmallows in your mouth. And then we were told to speak to each other, and her voice would be muffled because of all these... You know, these, these, these all the oppression. Oppressions, you know, <laughs> yeah. symbolized in these, you know, tasty little marshmallows that she was uh -huh. holding inside her cheek. Delaware's Residence Life Administrators developed a program that covered a variety of topical issues. There was special emphasis on race and race relations. It was all contained in a four-inch thick handbook. To drive these ideas home, students were required to participate in role-playing activities, and any racist or sexist speech was to be treated with the same urgency as a fire, rape, or a suicide attempt. In time, word spread about what was going on in the dormitories. Jan Blitz and Linda Gottfriedson are professors of long standing in the freshman honors program at the university. They care about their students and are accessible to them. Professor Gottfriedson teaches a variety of courses to freshman honor students, including intelligence in everyday life. Professor Blitz has taught in the freshman honors program since its inception. He is a noted Shakespearean scholar. The stated goals of the program were to change the students' attitudes, beliefs, actions, opinions on a whole range of social and political questions. Students began to talk about it and I just couldn't believe the stories. They were really in the business of trying to turn students, turn them in a certain political direction. So we followed up and parents also had complained, as it turned out, to FIRE, Foundation for Individual Rights in Education. The Foundation's core mission is to defend and sustain individual rights. 
such as freedom of speech at America's colleges and universities, and to educate the public when threats to these rights appear. Fire was initially contacted by a parent of a student at Delaware who informed us that they were having these uh, sessions, these um, uh, orientation sessions. The, the student in question is a white male and he was being taught uh, through some awful stereotypes and activities that promoted those stereotypes that he was uh, a racist oppressor. What made it particularly suspicious was that uh, materials were handed out to students that they weren't allowed to keep. The, 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 the Res Life officials demanded that all of these documents be handed back. Students came to me. I am known on campus as someone who will help students when they run into political correctness problems. I've helped students in the past. And I said something to my class, and sure enough, students started telling me what I thought were wildly exaggerated stories. Three of the many students who were puzzled and concerned by the Residence Life Program are Bill Rivers, Alicia Kozer, and Kelsey Lannan. Bill experienced the program as a first-year honors student. Kelsey was a first-year student in the honors dorm. Alicia was a residence assistant for two years. We had to um, put these big posters, big white posters, up all around the room. There were 13 of them. One was for African American, one was for gay people, one was for, you know, Hispanics, um, fat people. And um, people had to go around the room and write the first word that came to their mind. Like whenever they got to Hispanics, they would write like poor, lazy, milking the government. And, um, and everyone was laughing. The kid um, who was sitting next to me actually identifies as being Hispanic. So I was sitting there writing these terrible things about Hispanic people on there. And he's looking at it, you know, as if I believe these things. And I remember being really offended by what this group of guys wrote about women. They said that they were only good for cooking and cleaning. And I had never been a freshman in college before. This was my first night in a dorm with 40 other strangers I never met before. All the students would be asked questions about their views on social and political issues. If they agreed with something like uh, gay marriage, they would go to one side of the room, and if they disagreed, they would go to the other side. This was a way of making students reveal to all of the other students their deepest personal beliefs about the social and political issues of the day. She's saying, if you're a homosexual, stand up and we all clap and stuff. And If you are homosexual, shouldn't it be your decision to let people know? I felt like I was pressured into facilitating a lot of programs and things that I didn't really feel comfortable doing. They called out the category Pacific Islander and no one stood up because there didn't happen to be anyone who was a South Pacific Islander there. Mm -hmm. well, we're going to clap and recognize this group anyway. I think that uh, what racism is, is thinking about race when you see someone. And that's what they made us think about, was race when we saw someone. They, they tried to get rid of racism and stuff, but they just made it worse than it was in the first place. I'd had Professor Blitz uh, spring semester freshman year. And so sophomore year, he and I had kept up and I would go to visit him in his office. And um, I went up and I, I mentioned something of this to him and I, and I brought it up and, and he, he wanted to know more. I went to the director of residence life and I asked her about the program. And she very proudly handed me a file of hundreds of pages of damning evidence uh, explaining what the program really is. The Residence Life Handbook was a curriculum guide. The 7,000 dormitory students were expected to participate in the year-long program, which soon raised doubts about the judgment of the university administration and the trustees. Probably our greatest objection to it um, was that it counts as what we call thought reform. That is, that it wasn't, it wasn't curricular, it was mandatory, it was coercive, and with a specific goal of having students adopt particular ideological points of view. Now, it's even worse that they called it a treatment. Apparently, students at University of Delaware are morally sick, and the only people who can save them are the resident life uh, uh, officials. The program claimed to teach citizenship, which it said was the same thing as sustainability. When you look at the documents that the Residence Life Program had, you'll find such things as each student will recognize that systematic oppression exists in our society. Each student will recognize the benefits of dismantling 
systems of oppression. But this is what they're going to be doing all year long, is just hitting us over the head with this racism stuff, like, oh, you guys are so racist, don't be racist, don't be racist. Um, have I not learned this in, you know, from kindergarten on? Sustainability and citizenship were the overarching themes. They sound good and innocuous, and who can disagree with them? This is what they meant by citizenship to teach students that America is an oppressive country and they are responsible and they must change in order to change America. They gave us a survey at the beginning of the year and at the end of the year, both, of, both the same survey, saying, um, here's a little Scantron sheet to fill out, would you date an African-American person? Would you date a Muslim? Would you be friends with a homosexual? Would you you know, this and that, to judge how racist we were. What bothered me the most was this idea that people only have value or are only important because of differences that I can distinguish from them. And that you don't have, you're not important because you're a human being. You're important because you're from this race or you identify with this sexual orientation. And that's what gives you value and meaning. Which I'm a huge liberal, <laughs> as you guys know. And, <laughs> And I have problems with the program because even even if I believe it's important to recycle or to like I I support gay marriage, but that doesn't mean everyone in the school should have to abide by that ideology or feel like mm -hmm. a bad student. In addition to group activities, residents' life assistants conducted lengthy interrogations during which they took notes. In the large binder that I got from Residents Life, there are examples of the best and the worst. The best were, the, were instances where students said that their parents were racists, capitalists, and other terrible things. The, the, the worst included one instance where a student, when asked about her sexual identity, said it's none of your damn business. Whose business is it whether I would date an African-American person or not? Why does Res Life care about that? I was shocked to discover what was going on under our very noses. Um, and I think faculty on campus are still not aware of what was going on. Among the terrible effects of this program, the immediate effects were to intimidate and humiliate students. The long-term effect is to teach conformity that students should not think for themselves, they should follow the dictates of some authority. Now there are so many uh, different objections to this program and what I explain is that as bad as it is to tell people what they can't say, it's worse to tell people in a free society what they must say, but worse still and downright totalitarian to make citizens in a free society, particularly students, uh, tell them what they must think or believe. That's not what universities are supposed to be. FIRE will definitely be keeping an eye on the University of Delaware. I think anyone who's serious about education and about freedom should be outraged at this program. Students should be taught to think, not to begin discussions with someone else's conclusions. That was common in this program. America is an oppressive society. That's the premise. The question that we're to discuss today, how can we get rid of that? And it's not a real discussion. Students should, should ponder what the real issues are and come to their own conclusions. They should debate freely and not feel constrained. That's education and it's also freedom. You've just witnessed the most extensive and systematic attempt to mandate student belief that I've yet seen. But as you've also witnessed, brave students working with faculty and fire can successfully challenge programs that silence students or force them to conform to officially mandated beliefs. You may agree with the goals of the university's program, but it's no one's right to coerce students to adopt views against their conscience. FIRE would object to such an invasive program whether its ideology was patriotism, communism, anarchy, or even democracy. Free speech and free minds are beautiful ideals. And in a free society, if you want to change people's opinions, you need to rely on the power of your words and the persuasiveness of your arguments. 
In this case, the university relied instead on coercion, force, and threats. I urge you to visit our website, thefire.org, where you can learn more about some shocking violations of students and faculty rights and what you can do to defend yourself. As we say here at FIRE, know before you go.